Hey, Juan here. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the different product management frameworks, our priority frameworks that are going to help you prioritize your different features or work that you have to do and you make sure that you understand how they measure against other items in your roadmap. The first framework is RISE. RISE is going to help you understand what is the value of the features or the potential features that you would like to build and compare them with each other. RISE is an acronym and is referring to rich, impact, confidence and effort. And then it's built into an actual score that will help you compare different features to each other or against each other. All of these words are going to be defined by some kind of metric. Um, as metric, this one, of course, is going to be slightly subjective. So as always, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. The first one, reach, is going to actually measure what is the reach of your feature. How many people do you think that it's going to reach out to? And how many people is going to be benefiting from the feature that you're building or that you're actually planning? So the reach score is going to be given by the people or the amount of people that you think that this feature is going to be benefit within a reasonable time scale. Of course, you don't kind of think about years from now, potentially you're talking about when this feature is launched and maybe potentially the first year. Let's say that you create a new feature that is going to actually lead to some new customers being acquired. That is going to be about 500 customers. This 500 will be actually your reach score. Impact is going to be measuring how much people are going to make their purchase decision for your product based on the feature that you are developing. This obviously is going to be a very qualitative metric because it's going to be very difficult to actually measure it properly. But basically you can score it from a minimum impact to a very high impact of the feature. And this will give different impact scores for the minimum impact being around 0.25 and uh, all the way to 3 for those ones that had the maximum impact. By the way, these are the levels that Intercom has defined. I will link it below. If you made it so far to this video and you actually are enjoying it, I will appreciate if you give it a thumbs up. It helps massively the channel and it's free for you. As I said earlier, RISE is a score and a score is subjective. So confidence is actually going to measure how confident you are on the scoring that you are given so far. So there's going to be uh, from not being very confident on the, on the different scores that you have been given or actually be highly confident. Intercom is giving different scores for this confidence, starting from 50% up to all the way to 100% if you are completely confident that this that your estimates are correct. 50% meaning that pretty much this is a moonshot. And finally, there's the effort. The effort, as you can imagine, you have to work with engineering, you have to work with different units to understand how much people are going to have to work in this project to make sure that the feature is delivered. Once you understand the potential effort that is needed, again, potential effort, you don't know for sure how much effort is going to need, be needed. That's why we have the confidence as well. Typically, what you're going to do is measure it in person's month to give the actual score for confidence. Once you have calculated all these metrics, RISE score is going to be calculated as the product of the reach, the impact, and the confidence divided by the effort. RISE is a relatively simple way of actually trying to value different features against each other and seeing which ones are the ones that could have the highest potential for you as a company, as a business, or as a product. The next one that I'm going to cover is the Moscow model. Again, Moscow is an acronym and it actually has a couple of filler vowels on it. So it actually makes sense or there's a word that you can actually pronounce because that's why we build acronyms, isn't it? So again, Moscow is a prioritization technique that it will help you define for a product or a project what is has to be included as part of the project, what is completely out of the scope, and um, two intermediate levels that will help you prioritize additional features that would potentially be beneficial for your users. As for the acronym, what it means is M is going to stand for must have, S is going to stand for should have, C is going to stand for could have, and W is going to stand for won't have. So if you think about your development, about your project planning, product planning, feature planning, as defining an MVP of what you want to release to your customers, what the Moscow framework would help you with is defining what are the different levels and what are the different items or features that should be included or part of the deliverable for your users, part of that product that you are going to be building, your MVP. Must have, obviously, those are things that are going to be definitely part of the MVP. This is definitely the very, very minimum viable product, things that you know that you have to deliver that without them, 
nobody or people are actually not going to be interested in your product. This can be things like features, like very hardcore features, but it can be also design. It can be also appealing to the customer and bringing real value in an easy way that people actually can start using it. Should have is going to define what are the other features that if given time, if you had the time to go for them, you should actually go and include them in your product. Should have features can be a mix of quality of life features, but also very important features for your customers that are going to actually improve their experience and improve the capabilities of your product. Could have features are going to be features that probably are going to be nice to have features and potentially are going to be must have features down the road for your users. But at this point, especially when you're thinking about the initial release about your MVP are not going to be that important or that critical. And finally, there's going to be the won't have features. This can be features that you are sure that you don't want to do because they go against what your product should be, but also can be things that you want to deliberately leave out of the scope in this first initial part of the project. Think about could have features, think about should have features and won't have features as features that are might not be that important at a certain moment of the development, but down the line, maybe in one year or two years, they are going to be critical for you to have available for your users. So won't have doesn't mean that you won't have it ever. It, will, it means that you won't have it for the first launch of that product or project that you're building. And yes, the O's are only to make pronounceable the acronym. So they don't mean anything, at least as far as I know. <laughs> if you know otherwise, please let me know. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I use Moscow model as such, but in many ways I have been using it because when actually defining a product and defining the different phases that is going to be built, basically the way of prioritizing is the same one. You define the first phase where you want to have your must-haves. There might be a release or not by the end of the first phase, but then in the second phase you might have something like uh, the should-haves or some even could-haves that actually can be developed to together with some of the must-have features that you had to continue developing. And maybe then after that second phase, you are able to release. But you're already prioritizing some items there that you know that they might make it or they might not. And it's not the end of the world if they don't make it. So then it makes easier the way that you are facing your development and actually for the engineers to work against a plan that is more clearly defining what are the milestones that they should be achieving. They might make it or they might not. And it's not the end of the world if they don't make it. So then it makes easier the way that you are facing your development and actually for the engineers to work against a plan that is more clearly defining what are the milestones that they should be achieving. Next, we have the Kano model. I'm not completely sure how do you pronounce it, so sorry if, if I pronounce it in a way that you don't understand. I hope all is written there. This theory was developed by Professor Noriaki Kano. Again, sorry if I mispronounced that. And it studies the relationship between the development of a product and the user's satisfaction of that product. Again, this kind of model is going to look in different qualities for the different features to understand if these different features are actually improving the user experience of those users that you have, or is actually detracting on the user experience. Is making your users happier or is it actually making your users unhappy or is just leaving them indifferent? So first we will have must be qualities. Basically, this is the same as a must have quality. This is a quality that you definitely have to have in your product. In many cases, you can identify must be qualities or must have features relatively easily if you look up to what your competitors are having. These are going to be the things that all the competitors have in common. And if you don't have them, you basically are not going to pass the cut. They are not going to be the winning features, though, for you to win the competition. That's typically going to fall in a different category. Then there's going to be one dimension and qualities. These are actually going to either make happy your users if you have them, but if you don't have them, it's basically going to make them very unhappy. If these are fulfilled properly, your customers are going to be happy but if they are not fulfilled properly, your customers typically are going to have a bad user experience with you. Next, we are going to have the attractive quality. This attractive quality, this is going to be your delighters feature. These are the ones that actually are going to help you raise above your competition 
to do something different from what the others are offering as the must-haves, as the basic functionality that everybody should have. You can think about this, for example, in phones. Phones, usually they're going to have the basic functionality that everybody has to have, but then there's going to be the, the delighters. The delighters can be something like the actual experience of the user. You can just think about iPhone, that they are very famous and popular because of their designs. Then there's going to be the indifferent qualities. Typically, the indifferent quality are qualities of your product that you probably need to have, but are, going, are not going to have a very direct impact or at all in your customer base or for your user experience. Think about the programming language that you're using to code your product. Probably, in general, that does have a very heavy impact or direct impact that users are going to be able to identify. And yes, if you're a software engineer, you're probably thinking about the different performance of the different uh, languages, but in general, the users are not going to be able to identify that and they're not going to even care. Even if the performance or the optimization for a certain language is going to be better than other language, unless actually the experience is affected by the language that you're using. So as always, everything depends and that seems to be the conclusion for every single video. <laughs> And finally, there's reverse quality. These ones are going to be features that are going to detract from the experience that your users are having or from the experience that your users expect to have. Just think about, for example, if you are a product that is trying to focus a lot in simple user experience and simple design, if you are a lot of options, if you are a lot of complexity to the experience with lots of settings, this is probably something that your users are probably not going to be happy about. So one of the interesting things from the Kano model is that how the user experience evolves over time. So what you will see is that there's going to be a graph that defines how a feature once it's completed, how it's going to be given the actual good experience or better experience for the users. But no matter what the experience is now, all that experience and all that nice user experience, even if it goes to the highest level to be a delighter, is going to be actually moving down over time, meaning that a feature that can be a delighter right now is probably over time going to be a just to a nice to have feature and on the very long term is going to be a must have feature. This is because we are just all the time evolving and actually trying to improve the products and competition is obviously catching up. And these are features that nowadays everybody has to have because otherwise they would basically not make it through the cut on the competition. Then there is the value versus effort framework. This framework will measure the value that a certain feature brings to your customers or to your business. Because remember, value to customers equals better business. You build impact on the business by bringing value to your customers. And it will measure it against the effort that it takes to actually develop that feature. The ideas are going to be measured in two axes. The vertical axis is going to measure the business value with low in the bottom, a high business value in the top, and the horizontal axis is going to measure the effort, with low effort being in the left-hand side and high effort being in the right-hand side. Once you are able to define if a feature is uh, it has a high or low impact or it has a low or high effort to be developed, you are going to be able to plot them into this graph. Once you plot them, it's going to be relatively easily to understand the four quadrants in this graph. In the upper left, you're going to have your easy wins. These are going to be features that are not going to take you a lot of effort to implement, but are going to have a high impact on your business. You could consider this as low hungry fruits that actually have a good impact on the business. On the upper right, you are going to have your big bets. Here typically are going to be your long-term projects, your long-term features that you understand that once I build them, it's going to take me a long time. It might take me one or two years to build or even longer, but it's going to have a really, really high impact on the business. On the lower left, you are going to have your incremental features. These are going to be features that are going to require a low effort for you but are going to have a relatively low impact on your business. These are many times going to be features that promote retention amongst your existing customers. And finally, you're going to have in the lower right hand side, the money pits. These are going to be features that are going to be very costly, but they have very little to no return on investment. So there's very little value for your users. There's very little 
point in actually developing this because potentially this is not going to bring value to your users and it's not going to be bringing any impact on your business. So you typically want to avoid these ones. So many times when people actually look into this framework, the way of working is that anything that is in the easy wins are things that will have the highest priority. Then you have the long-term bets, which you would try to schedule on the longer term that you know that are going to potentially give you a big impact on the, on the business. And finally, there is the money pits. These are the features that you want to avoid to develop at all costs. And whenever you have time, you will take features from your incremental box or your incremental quadrant, because those are things that are going to promote and make sure that people understand that you're paying attention to their needs, but you know that for you and for your business are not going to have a very high impact. And finally, there is the priority poker. This is very related to the agile planning poker. What this one is actually promoting is something like a priority or prioritization as a democracy, but only as a democracy between the stakeholders that actually have a valid vote. So what you will do in this case is that you will try to identify different features and you will have a different stakeholders voting for that feature. So the feature can be just the feature, it can be a user story if you're thinking about Agile, it can be an actual product, it can be quite many things. Just it's a way for you to help you to identify the highest priority items on your list. How this typically plays is that everybody has a vote that they can give for each one of the features. And the vote is just going to be a score between one and three, one and five, depends on how you want to do the scale. Obviously, typically starting with one being the lowest priority and whatever is the upper limit being the highest priority. What you want to do when you play this priority poker is that you want to make sure that everybody votes anonymously and that everybody can cast their vote without having a bias from the rest of the stakeholders. This is important because many times people just vote something because somebody else that they either respect or that they look up to has voted something, they will just mimic the way of prioritization. So with priority poker, what you want to do is that you want to try to identify what are the highest priorities for us as a group, for us as, that's why I was talking about, kind of priority as a democracy and making sure that these priorities are given in a non-biased way, an anonymous way to help you understand what are the priorities for this group. I actually have used this method sometimes for prioritizing features, but also in workshops to understand what are the highest priorities are out of different items that have been discussed in the workshop and also in workshops that are built around designing a new Product. So do you actually need to use these frameworks in order to prioritize your work? Well, in my opinion, no, because typically this can be quite rigid and can look at prioritizing from just one point. All of them combined make a lot of sense, but it's difficult to combine them into just one mighty framework. As I said earlier, I work with components that are present in some of the different frameworks and reuse them. In the end, what you want to have is some kind of a structure that you follow in order to make priorities and that you actually avoid making gut decisions. That is the main goal. You have to have a structured way of working that is your own framework that can be based around of any of these models, but it doesn't always have to be as strict and potentially rigid as one of these frameworks. And I don't have anything against them. In general, I have tried some of some frameworks and typically you end up always redoing it to suit your needs or just using different components of different ones. So how about you? Do you use any framework? Do you use a mix of them? Do you think that these frameworks are the way to go or how do you actually do priorities for your work? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, it helps massively and I will see you in the next video. Stay safe.